week's session on animal photography. I think we will have lots of people check out the recorded link of this because I've had several questions, but maybe people have plans this afternoon, which is fine. It is a beautiful day here, at least in Northwest Indiana. So um, we're thankful you could join us today. I'm super excited to have Phil Reed, who's the Distance Education Coordinator for the Department of Animal Science, aka the man with the camera. He um, He's a huge asset to the Animal Science Department and has a multitude of experience behind the camera. And I know I appreciate all of his help in various projects that I do. Um, so when we decided that we were going to have more virtual opportunities this summer, I thought Phil would be a great person to kind of walk through some basic animal photography, including everything from beef cattle to llamas to rabbits and poultry. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Phil. Just a couple housekeeping notes. Um, I ask that everybody remain muted and keep their cameras off to help kind of with interference. But if you do have questions, feel free to look down at the bottom there and you can pop them in the chat room. Also for um, educators and youth and parents that may be tuning in, we do have um, Kara Harbison, who is the 4-H online and fair entry specialist for Indiana 4-H on, on the call too. So she can help answer questions specifically as they relate to that. So without further ado, here's Phil. Great. Thank, Court. Thank you, Kurt, Courtney. And I'm going to share my screen. And start. See the first slide? Courtney, can you see my first slide? Yes, I can. Great. Now you can. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, visit with you folks today about uh, doing your photographs and videos for your virtual show. A uh, little bit about me. I'm originally from Central Virginia, a uh, little town called Rustburg. Uh, Virginia Tech graduate in animal sciences, worked at the cattle barn there and had a professor that uh, started my interest in photography with a project he gave me at, at one time. Uh, from there, I went on and did uh, my graduate work at Penn State University. And after that, I had a job selling advertising, which I also needed to learn how to do photography at the same time. So it all worked in together. About four or five years later, I decided to start my own photography business. And I had a livestock photography business for about 20 years after that. Uh, so one of these days I'm going to write a book. And uh, if I haven't seen it, it probably hasn't happened yet, at least in the livestock photography end of it. First, I have to give you a disclaimer. Before enacting any piece of advice or recommendation, please consult your county and state rules. I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to intentionally try to lead you astray on any of this. But the thing is, please check your rules before you do any of it. And in particular, in the part of beef and dairy, uh, swine and sheep, the fitting rules. Uh, if you're a no-fit, don't fit your cattle. Uh, most of the others, I think, can't think of anything else that, that would be, but check, check your rules. And make sure that you're in compliance with your rules, not only rules and guidelines, not only from the state, but also from your county rules. Oops. So basically this, I'm, this talk is going to be in two parts. The first part is going to be a checklist that applies to all general photography and videography. Before I start, those of you who may be seniors and will be at Purdue next year, I do teach a course in livestock photography and video. Uh, it's called uh, Livestock Media Production, ANSC 493. 
and it's taught in the spring semester, and there is no prerequisite except that you have livestock experience. So probably one of the most important things that I could tell you guys to, to concentrate on when you're getting ready to take those important uh, show photographs is to practice with a phone or camera that you're going to be using. Go out maybe one entire weekend, a Saturday and a Sunday. Go out, use your camera, take photographs, take a photograph of a car, take a photograph of a bush, maybe a, a, you know, a dog. Just get used to that camera. And when you see it isn't working with something, try to figure out why it's not working with that. Because if that car looks faded out and shiny and nasty looking, the chances are your animals won't look much better. The second thing is know your phone and camera settings inside out. Use that camera again, you know, spend a whole day, take a, and literally a couple hundred photographs and a couple dozen videos. Know that camera, know it well, know how to use it. The third thing and the biggest thing that you can do yourself to make sure that, you know, this photo or video session is going to work, is make sure your animal is clean. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a pygmy, pygmy goat or, or a 1,400-pound steer. Make sure that animal is clean. Uh, it is amazing the difference a clean animal will make versus an animal that has not been worked on or cleaned. Now, also along with this comes probably if you are permitted to fit that animal, and I'm talking mainly about the larger meat animals, the uh, heifers, steers, uh, cow, dairy cows, uh, meat goats. If you're allowed to do that, fit that animal, which means having it fit it up just like you would for a show. Go ahead and put all your special stuff on that animal and have it ready to go. That is just so, so, so important. Pay attention what is behind you when you photograph the animal. If you have an old rusted out tractor or a silage harvester behind it, that's not going to make for a very attractive background. The other thing is, if you have a dark colored animal, do not put it in front of a grove of trees that is dark. You'll lose that animal in the trees. Try to have uh, a light colored background. Try to have the sky behind that background. The same way, if you have a Charlet animal, do not put that animal, shoot it right up into the bright sun or on a, against a white barn. That's not going to work. You, you, you'll see bits of the nose and the eyes and the ears, and that's probably all. The day before, go out and scout these areas. Find out, okay, we're going to take this photograph here, that photograph there. This white llama, we're going to take it over against this grove of trees. It's just going to make for a lot better, much better photograph. Um, again, distracting backgrounds, like a pickup truck sitting in the background or a car. I believe one of the, uh, one of the rules that we have is that the exhibitor must appear in at least one photograph. Uh, make sure that you follow, follow that. Uh, pay attention, you know, line up knowledgeable people to help assist you. Folks, this is not something you can do by yourself. I don't care what animal you have, whether it is a uh, pygmy goat or a, a huge steer. You're going to need help. You're going to need probably on large animals at least two people, and maybe two to three people even on the smaller ones. You will need one person to work the camera, to take the photo. That's really, really important. So you're going to need to know that photograph and then teach that person how to frame and how to use that camera.
to the best advantage because you are actually going to be in one of the photos. Uh, you will need another person. One of the things, and we'll talk about this in a minute or so, we want these cattle to look, cattle, pigs, whatever, to look uh, alert. And that generally means having the ears up, having them stand up straight. So you'll need somebody in front of that animal to get its attention, to attract its ears and make its ears go forward. Or in the case of say like a llama, the ears go up. So you need a whole crew and you need to be able to com communicate with that crew, tell that crew exactly what you want and talk to the crew, especially, you know, rehearse everything before you, with your crew. Tell them, okay, I'm going to lead this animal to this point. I'm going to set this animal up. We'll talk about that in a moment also. And then when I whistle to you, I want you to make noise ahead of that animal to get their attention. I'll be yanking on the, on the chain to get that animal's head up and the ears forward. This is so, so, so important that that animal looks very, very alert. One thing I will stress is always act calm with all your animals. They can't read your mind. They can't even understand what you're saying. It's so important. Do not take a hand to any of these animals. I see kids in showmanship beating on their animal in showmanship. They go to the bottom, I don't care who they are, they go to the bottom of the class. So respect those animals, act calm with them. Try to get them to do what you want because they want to please you. And believe it or not, every one of these animals that you've worked with for such a long time, their biggest thing is they want to please you. And we'll go to the next page. When you're taking this, these photographs, whether they're, and we will talk about horizontal versus vertical uh, in a little bit, but fill that frame no fuller than 75% with your subject. Leave, do not just absolutely have uh, the one hind foot in one corner of the photograph and the back of your head in the other. Leave some area for the subject. It makes for a much, much nicer photograph. And that's whether you're shooting vertical or horizontal. If an animal is not going to cooperate with you within 15 minutes, whether it's a hot day or not, Put, the have, let, put that animal back in, let it rest. If you have a second animal, bring that one out, work with that animal, and then come back to that animal. Or maybe try it the next morning. Uh, animals have good days and bad days, just like all of us. They really do. And figuring out when the best time, and some, some animals work great in the morning. Some of them work great or horrible in the afternoon. Uh, I can remember I, I did a bunch of show cattle photography one time in Maryland. Uh, between 9 a.m. and noon when we broke for lunch, we did 14 head. From two till five, we did three. Uh, the animals just did not want to work that afternoon. It's, it's just one of those things. This is not true, this is not only true, with beef cow, it's true with everything. Some cattle and some things, every animal has a unique personality. And to get that animal, and we were talking about getting animals' attention, some animals work and get excited by visual clues, others by auditory clues. Some old show heifers won't give you their head up or won't get their head up for nothing. I guess that's bad grammar for anything. So, you know, the, the thing of it is every animal has its own mystique, 
it has its own personality. And if you work with that animal a lot, the animal will get to know you and you will get to know the animal and that will make, make it very, very easy. Take a lot of photographs. I mean, uh, don't, you know, one of the things when I was first getting started in the business, we used film. And every, and I, I would tell these, the younger photographers these days that uh, I would uh, be taken aback and taking a lot of the photographs you do now because I had it figured out that every time I pulled my shutter, took a photograph, it cost, it cost me 47 cents. Uh, so you shoot eight, 10, 12 rolls of film. I mean, you're in a couple hundred dollars. Here, everything is digital. There's no penalty for taking a lot of photographs. Take lots of photographs because you never really know which one's going to work. Again, animals must look alert. Your person, the, I call them the ear person. Uh, generally, I tell them, get a little horn or a, if you can get a hand tape recorder with cattle bellowing in it, with hogs, sound of hogs grunting and eating, it's great. Uh, I used to have, uh, I guess, Hardee's at one time uh, gave away these little things and it, you push it and it would sound like space invaders. Well, I was photographing at the Maryland State Fair one time. This little kid was walking by. We, were, we couldn't get this heifer's ears up or nothing. This kid walked by and started hitting on that little thing he got from Hardee's. And that heifer's head went up and the ears went forward. That afternoon, I went up and bought one of them. Whatever kind of works. Uh, but they really need to not just have their head ears forward, but they need to have their head up. And especially if you're at the holder, you need to get that head up. The head turns slightly out and you need to have somebody in front of that animal getting that animal's attention. It's just a preference of mine. I prefer to have animal, work animals facing left, and especially if they're on the holder, you sure as the devil want to have them facing left, moving from left to right. Uh, there's, you know, if, if, especially if they're in a holder, you move them from left to right. Uh, shooting backwards, I bet in 20 years of photography at shows, I bet there's been no more than three animals I ever shot backwards, and that's out of thousands. We just worked that animal until we got it right. Let's just try this. And generally, shoot the right side of the animal if the animal is being haltered. If that animal is loose and you really want to challenge and want to be real professional, you, you know, shoot it off the halter. But for something like this, uh, I don't think you want to try shooting, shooting it off the halter, whether it's a lamb or whatever, uh, and not just a halter. If, I mean, if you're doing the uh, dairy goat or meat goat, you know, you're using a chain or a strap. Uh, you're probably, you're better off. And that's the nice thing about dairy goats and, and meat goats. You show them with that chain or with that, I've seen them use straps too. Uh, you can actually show that animal from either side. Uh, but I still prefer an animal that's moving from my left to my right. Um, on side shots of the animal, we should see the exhibitor. That is just one of the guidelines that we have here. The other thing, and I may come out on it, upon it later, is that one of the big things that I tell people uh, on any animal, I don't care what they are, except for maybe chickens, uh, you need to see all four feet. And the reason that is, if you only see the front foot, a front foot, and a back foot, that photograph is flat. If you can see all four feet, the photograph looks three-dimensional. 
And that's whether you're shooting a front shot, three quarter shot, three quarter back shot, you should see all four feet. And like I said, that applies to everything but chickens. Uh, of course, on front and rear views, that's probably not going to be the smartest thing to do. One of the tips I would give you guys, if you, if you can do this as far as your local rules and everything, take all your photographs and if you're doing video of an animal, of a single animal, and place it in a PowerPoint file. That way, a photograph can't get separated from the others. A file cannot get separated from the others. Everything is right there. Your photos, your video, and if you're doing photographs, I would take your first page on your, and again, check your local rules, but take your first page on that, uh, on that PowerPoint file and put some information about that animal. Maybe where you bought that animal, uh, if she's bred or not, who her sire is, who her dam is. Uh, or what steer, you know, maybe the half brother of that steer won an important show the year before. Uh, maybe even talk about what it's, has been fed. But give, you know, when, when I do something like this, I like to have uh, every, every one of these tells a story. And to me, it's very, very important that every photo tells a story and PowerPoint gives you an extra if you're allowed to do it, we'll give you a little extra to do that. The other thing, and we hadn't talked about too much for video yet, uh, during a video, if you are shooting a video, uh, I would take maybe, uh, they say two to three minutes. I mean, two minutes is sure enough plenty, but I would take at least between 15 and 30 seconds, shoot it in your house, and tell about this animal. Again, it tells the story of this animal. You know, uh, where it came from, what its pedigree is like. Uh, you know, if, uh, if you walk it every day, put something about that in there. Uh, you know, the feed it's fed. But uh, just a short 30 second, if you're allowed, put that in, put that in the vide video or PowerPoint right at the very beginning. Mm. For outside photographs, bright or slightly subdued sun is probably preferred. I like morning sun, especially this time of year. Uh, we want to shoot. Uh, man, I, I, have, uh, I have started a job as early as 6 a.m because it's not gonna be nice and cool. And if you don't have any uh, fog, it's gonna be nice, it's gonna be cool. The animals will feel frisky, they've just eaten. You can bring them out and they may be easy to work, easier to work with than say like one or two in the afternoon. Uh, I would avoid doing any type of photography when sun is directly overhead, which in, this time of year, since we're on daylight savings time, would not be noon, it would be 11 o'clock. So about 10 or 10.30, I would break until probably about 1.30 or 2 o'clock. Uh, afternoon sun is very is good too. If you get down in the fall, uh, you start getting into shadows. Uh, make sure that you're photographer does not cast a shadow on your animal on any of the photographs. Always, always, always have your back to the sun and your shadow between the animal and, and you. In other words, the animal is, at, let's say we're looking at a hands of a clock, the animal is at 12 o'clock. The, photo the photographer is standing at 6 o'clock. Photographers should look ahead and right in the middle of the clock should be where your, your, your shadow is. Your shadow should between, be between, the photographer's shadow should, should between, be between the photographer and the subject. 
never, ever uh, shoot into the sun. It is just a recipe for disaster. Uh, and uh, I saw this fella, he did a wonderful photograph of a heifer the other day, was doing it for advertising, and uh, the shadow was in front of the heifer. The sun was behind the heifer. And the heifer was a black blob. And it was a great photo, but there was no definition in it. You couldn't really see whether a heifer was muscled or not because she was standing in her own shadow. Uh, once again, make sure the photographer's shadow does not appear in the photo or video. I'm a big believer in zoom lenses, uh, and you can actually zoom on, on an iPhone. And that's not a problem. Uh, I'm not really good at uh, uh, spelling, so that should be identify the file containing the photos, video, etc. If you're not going to put them in PowerPoint with a file name, including your name, the animal's name, and the species. Just like down below, Tom Jones, Past Pride, Angus Heffer. That's if that photograph, that in case, of, in case of a PowerPoint, it would be like a JPG in the case of a photograph. Uh, if a photo, if say the side view photo gets misplaced, it is identified by the file name. So I, I always do that. It's helpful to have information about your project on the slide. We've kind of talked about that already. It really paints a picture, and I think it's very, very, very important. Uh, when you're doing a photograph, make it as uh, big as you can on the PowerPoint slide. The same applies for the, uh, if you do a video and include a video on the PowerPoint slide. One of the things we, and actually it isn't included in here, on, if you want to do a video, uh, you want three views of that animal in one video. So you want that animal walking away, you want that animal walking forward, and if you have a zoom, that's going to come in really handy as that animal gets further away, you're going to zoom in tighter to it, and you can do that on an iPhone same way with that animal moving forward towards you. When the animal is moving from side to side, you should, if you know the word pan, in other words, you're going to follow that animal from side to side. And again, I like, if, if for somebody at the holder, you need to be moving from the, the left to the right. And uh, again, the Guidelines say two to three minutes. I think two to three minutes is plenty of time, even including a half an hour to tell about your project. If you are photographing indoors with small animals, build a small stage using an area rug. And we are going to discuss this in, I think, in the three species of small animals we talk about later in this talk. And I'll show you how to actually build a stage with, a, with, a, with an area rug. Make sure that the color does not match a white rug and a white rabbit or clash a black rug and a white rabbit. Uh, but again, this is for small, the smaller animals or if you're, or even the larger animals, if you're shooting against say a barn or uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, some big white expanse. You don't want a black animal on a white background, a white animal on a black background. Uh, generally, try to pick something that's in between. And especially on little animals, if you're going to build this stage, do it with a pastel. Ask your mom and dad what a pastel is. It's not exactly, uh, it's a blue pastel is not exactly blue and it's not exactly white. Get something kind of in between. If photographing or videoing outside, be sure to use fly spray. And I can't stress this enough. I would also encourage you to use an oily fly spray like a dairy bomb 
which is an aerosol, a great big aerosol can that you can spray on that animal. Especially if you're shooting outside, spray the head, the tail, the belly, and the legs. It's very important. The second thing, and we'll talk about this when we talk about uh, cattle, is that that oily type fly spray, the uh, dairy bomb type fly spray, will add a little sheen to that animal too. And it's, it may not be considered as fitting to use an oily fly spray. Uh, it would have the same, for those of you that uh, dress cattle, uh, beef cattle, uh, it would have the same effect as a final mist. The one thing I would tell you, spray it on there before you take that animal out of the chute, put your fly spray on there, or if you're using final mist, put final mist in there. If the animal has hair, do not comb it in. Leave it set. Do not put a brush on it. Do not put a comb on it. It will look so much better. Uh, when working outside, make sure you have the grass mowed, lawnmower style, two and a half to three inches. And that is in your entire working area, not just a strip, but in the entire area, make sure that you have that grass mowed tight and like, like the day before. It's just, it is really, really important. It's very distracting to see blades of grass sticking up on the side of the nail. It really is. If you're doing video, mow that entire pen where you're videoing. I'm assuming whether you're videoing on the holder or not. It's, it's just really, really important. Uh, let's see. Okay, these are not on your list that I gave you. When you're photographing or videoing, no matter what it is, the camera, phone, whatever, should be level with that animal's eye. Now, even a little easier to figure than that, level with its eye or with its top line. Uh, one of the things, and I mean, we'll talk about this when we get into dairy photography, is that uh, you want that top line either level or rising. Beef cattle, we like it just plain level. Uh, but you need to have, do not, if you, especially if you're using some type of a tripod, even on your um, phone, because they do make tripods for iPhones these days. Uh, make sure that it's level with that animal's eye. Do not jack it way up. Back in the day, when we were trying to make these animals look bigger and not necessarily better, we would get on the ground and shoot straight up at them. We don't do that anymore. Uh, we try to make them look better. If you think it's a really good idea to uh, shower glitter over your animal, don't. Glitter basically are little tiny mirrors and every place you have a, uh, and especially if you're doing inside, and using some type of artificial lighting or a flash, they'll turn out just like little mirrors and you'll see these little white holes all over your animal. Uh, I tell people, I've told people this at county fairs for years and years and years when I worked them, it didn't make any, it didn't make any difference. They, they went ahead and did it anyway. Always make sure you can see all four feet. We talked about this before, we may have talked about this before. If you can see all four feet, that animal looks like it is in three dimensions. If two of the feet are hiding, you know, if you can only see two feet, yeah, that's horrible. If you can only see three, that's gonna, especially if it's, if it's the animal, those front feet are together and you can only see one foot, that makes that animal look really bad shoulder. So you want that animal to spread all four of those feet. You want to be able to see all four of the feet. We get in the photos, we'll talk about this even more. Line up your shop on the animal's navel. That's probably pretty much where you could shoot, should shoot. Shoot that animal, uh, look at it. 90%, well, 80% of cattle, whether they're dairy or, or whatever, Generally, you'll start on the level, uh, on the navel, 
then you'll move to the left, you may move to the left or right to enhance, uh, to enhance something or other or detract or hide something that that animal has. Maybe that animal has a lot of, uh, a lot of leather on its neck. If you move back toward the, toward the hip, guess what? I can actually make it disappear without Photoshop. Showman should wear traditional, clean show guard. This is so important. You don't take that picture in flip flops and shorts. Don't do that. Wear your show clothes just like you would if you were showing the animal. That's for video, that's for photography, and that is for all the photographs the front view, side view, rear view, and they should be clean. In other words, you don't want to look like somebody that's been sitting on the rascal. Uh, and then the last thing is use video or photo to tell your story. One of the most important things, one of the most important lessons of this, uh, of raising an animal in 4-H and FFA to me is that you learn, number one, you learn responsibility, but you also learn to be a great salesman. It's in, in here, it's no different. You're wanting to tell your story to, to a judge. And I think the best way to tell your story is to have a really, really good photograph. And if you're allowed, tell about that animal, either in your PowerPoint well, in, mainly in your PowerPoint or in the first 30 seconds of your video. Now, I have a second set of slides that we're going to go through really quick. And uh, Courtney, do you have any photographs while I'm doing this? I don't. I don't. I could show you some corgis, but. <laughs> oh, okay. I apologize to those that are joining. I am not sure. Some people got in fine. I kind of wondered why our numbers were low, but apparently the original link put you in a waiting room, and I'm not sure exactly what happened, but rest assured I'm going to, uh, this whole session's been recorded, so we will get it posted and send it out to your friends who maybe missed out on joining, and I know Phil's more than willing to answer questions for you. So um, I'm sure he would be happy to provide his email address. To I did not, did not make a slide with my email address or my phone. Okay. Uh, if they want to text, I think you have my, my cell phone. Yeah. If they want to text me, that's great. Right now, my, one of the things I have on my phone, if you are not in my contact list, it sends you directly to voicemail. Uh, oh. so if you call me, you probably will get shuttled off to voicemail. Okay. Uh, but if you text me or if you email me, I will be, uh, if, even if you, if you put a phone number in there, I'll be happy to talk with you and consult. Okay. Awesome. I'll probably just share your email. That way I'm not, Okay. I'm not selling your phone number to the, not our 4-H folks, but I'm always concerned about sharing phone numbers. <laughs> but if they will send me their number, I will call them back. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Let's, let's talk about individual species. Again, these photographs were harvested since uh, you called me, Courtney, about a week ago. Uh, that wasn't enough time to get all these photographs done. So I resorted to the internet. Uh, again, these are not to uh, cast derision or uh, embarrass anybody, uh, but they are good, good photographs. And uh, let's just start with talk with beef. Uh, of course, that's a side view, that first photograph uh, in, the, in the middle. The young man's doing a great job. You can see that. Hey, Phil, um, your screen is not, I don't think you got to reshare it. We see you. Sorry about that. Okay. 
I'm sorry. I, I should have realized that. Uh, let's see. No worries. Uh, how about now? Yep, you're good to go. Beef cattle, okay. Uh, young man in the middle, I think that's a excellent. I mean, the, the background's a little busy, but it's not, that's not horrible. Uh, he's done a good job. That animal is, looks like it's been fitted, been clipped out. Uh, has the head up, has the ears forward. The Charlet on the left, I'll tell you what, do not be afraid if, uh, if an animal just won't stand for a rear, rear view. Go ahead and put them in the chute. Put them in the chute and, and take their photograph. Uh, the little Hereford on the, on the right, again, you know, it's uh, front end shot. Probably if I would, one of the things I would do Man, you're gonna throw you're gonna throw rocks at me, Courtney. But one of the things I would probably do is I would rake some sawdust up around that rascal's front feet so they don't look turned out so bad. Uh, but again, you're you, it's it's basically another type of showmanship. Uh, you know, all these photographs I think are very good, very 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 acceptable. At least they're the better ones that I could find. Uh, going through the internet, uh, again, all this tells a story. It, you want it to tell a story about your animal. Uh, I really love the one in the middle. Even though the, I'm, I'm figuring it's probably a Brangus, but I, I think it's an excellent photograph in the middle. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about Uh, have a, any questions about beef? We do not have any questions in the chat box. Okay, great. We'll move along to dairy. Dairy is kind of interesting because everything you do, you learn to do in beef and set these cattle up in dairy, at least on cattle that are on, in milk, you do backwards. Uh, you can see that photograph in the middle. The legs are set exactly the opposite of that they are in the, with beef cattle. Now the reason for that is you want to see that strong uh, udder attachment in the rear with from this Ayrshire cow. Uh, uh, once again, as you're taking that photo, the, the other thing I would be critical of, uh, other than some really, I call them ugly photographs of dairy cattle that I found, uh, I wouldn't want that young man in the background. I'd want those ears forward. But the head is up. She is probably right in the middle of showing. Uh, on the right, you'll see a young man that has the animal posed be from behind. Uh, I try to find a photograph with it when the tail is in an action. And uh, the photograph on the left, again, I wish that animal was more alert in the head and the head was straight forward and the ears were uh, further forward. One thing about halter and halters and that type of thing, uh, if you have a black animal, I do not have a problem in the world with you using a rope halter. I really don't. Uh, especially if you have an animal that might be, a, might be hard to control. So next we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna go dairy goats. Now, here you only see two photographs. Um, honestly, I couldn't find any front photographs of anybody that photographed the front of a dairy goat. And I don't know why the, oops, I don't know why you would. This photo on the left-hand side is absolutely fantastic. Now, if you're doing this for a project, you need to kneel down and get in that photograph. But that animal is alert, its head is turned. You can see all four feet. You can see that rear udder attachment, just like in a dairy cow. They do take a lot of rear shots or udder shots in the dairy goat world. I used to photograph, I guess at the top, 10 to 15 dairy goat shows a year all over the East Coast. They really like this udder shot like this. So a good udder shot, 
well lit. And I'll tell you what, this was from 2007 National Show. That photograph, that is the epitome of a good dairy goat photograph. Meat goats, they are a little bit different than everything. You'll rarely see, well, you will almost never see a rear shot, that many rear shots of an individual meat goat. You'll see some, but they usually aren't done very well. However, you'll see uh, if you go 45 degrees off of your navel, you will see uh, these, cat, these, these guys uh, feel that it shows the muscle off better in that goat and thickness and, and everything. So the first photograph, the young man, you can see all of him as what's required for, you know, what's required by your guideline. The second one, really massive, it shows that goat has a lot of meat and muscle in its rear end. The third, you'll see a lot of stud, even though this isn't a stud, a stud, stud goats, they'll take a three-quarter on photograph to make that animal look more massive. Oh my God, my favorite llamas. Uh, llamas, you rarely see a rear shot. We have one here, uh, but the big thing is that animal needs to be, you need to see four feet on that animal. And the second thing is that head and those ears need to be up and that animal needs to be alert. So if you have llamas, you need to have somebody with a horn, maybe even one of those uh, uh, Freon based horns blow it to get those head, that head up and those ears forward. As you can see in each of these, that really, really, really makes the photo. Pygmy goats. What the, what can I say? Uh, these, these animals, uh, if you're going to shoot pygmy goats, uh, basically you just set them the way you would uh, any other meat. Well, they're not really a meat animal, they're a pet. Uh, I search and search and search. These were the two best pygmy goat photographs I could find. But the thing is, you know, have your pygmy goats clean, have them ready to go, and uh, have them well trained, whether you're using a strap or a chain. Okay, sheep. Three outstanding sheep photographs here. There are hundreds of them like this. Uh, again, have your animal impeccably clean. Young man in the middle. I, I wish I could see all four legs, but this animal, he's right in the middle of showing. Getting that top down. Head up you know, again, have that head cradled up. Uh, I know somebody's going to ask me about bracing. Brace. Here's the thing. When you brace a sheep, don't make it look obvious. Don't make it, don't take those front feet six inches off the damn ground. Do not do that. But brace it, put that knee in there. As you can see, he's doing in the middle photo. Brace it, make that top come up, and then level it down. Swine. Uh, hopefully, if swine, you have a pull pan or have a sprayer. That's how you can get those animals to move. Uh, again, look at the foot structure in the middle photograph. That's pretty much ideal. And out, since you don't have a holder on these, you walk them into that one step at a time. The rear shot, drop some feed down there, shoot the rear shot. Generally front shots are as the animals are being driven towards you, almost always. Poultry, now the next 
two, maybe three, I'm going to what I'm talking about, table species. Poultrykeeper.com has an excellent, excellent, excellent sec section on photographing fowl. Uh, as you can see, most of these are, that's where these were taken. Um, it, in the upper left-hand corner, remember I told you take a rug and make a, uh, a table. If you can see what he's done there, he's taken a pastel rug and then he's pulled it back and then pulled it up behind. So you have no corners. Excellent, excellent thing to do. If you have a light, you do not need a four or $500 photo light to do this. Get a couple of desk lamps. If you have desk lamps or any type of lighting, but take that, put, put the, um, on the table and then curve that uh, piece of carpet or rug around and use something so it's, you know, maybe uh, a little bit of uh, plywood so it sits up straight. And then you can see the photograph in the middle there. What a great job that did. You don't have to do that. You can see the turkey. I guess it's a turkey down at the bottom. Um, basically shot in its cage. Um, again, you can see feet, two feet. Um, the Hendricks County photo, I cut the, I probably cut that off a little bit. It's a full photograph. You can see the feet and everything. But again, it's taken from within the cage. The one to the right of that, you don't necessarily need to build that. But the thing of it is that, that I see here, uh, it's very likely that that animal could take off that picnic table and be gone. And the young lady, uh, in the upper right hand corner. Again, you want your you want that exhibitor at least one of these photographs. So that makes room for a photograph like the upper right hand corner. Rabbits. Down at the bottom you will see a URL for a book called The Domestic Rabbit. It is by the University of Florida Extension System and it is fantastic. It is free free download. You can download it and uh, print it. And what I want you to refer to is the page 221 in that, in that book that you can download. The thing that's unique about rabbits is there are 50, 40 or 50 different breeds of rabbits. And many of them do not have the ideal pose position. In other words, if you will go to 250, 221 in the following pages, it will list every different breed of rabbit and their standard posing position. You can see in the upper left-hand corner, that's a pretty much a standard pose. Standard pose is illustrated. This is actually from that domestic rabbit book. The front legs extended on alert. That's another posing position. Once again, you know, going back to the lower right hand corner, there's your front view of a, I think that's a New Zealand white, maybe. Uh, again, they used carpet and carpet that wasn't white. And we brought back that same photo again, create that for your rabbit. You have your backdrop, you'll have something for the, the rabbit to stand on and I mean, I can't um, stress how good that this uh, rabbit book is. It is absolutely excellent. And then uh, if any of you, I apologize for leaving your species out. Uh, I tried to cover all of them. Uh, uh, get in touch with me and I'll be happy to, to uh, you know, fill in what I missed. Courtney, do we have any questions? 
Oops, sorry, I was muted. Uh, I do not see any. So if you have any, feel free to drop them in the chat box. Again, Kara's here. If you have more logistical questions related to uh, fair entry, she'd be happy to help you with those or direct you to, direct you to some resources that could help. Um, again, I'm gonna share this. I'm gonna send out the link when we have it posted as well as the survey link via 4-H online. Um, sorry for the issues, I'm not sure I have stuck myself on exactly what we did, but um, apparently tried to start two meetings at once or something to that nature. So I do apologize again, but definitely appreciate Phil and his time today. Um, I know this is a new venture for many of us. And if you're like me, you've tried to take pictures of your livestock before, but uh, no one's ever really judged me on that. I guess if you count, selling animals and that kind of thing, then those people are the judge, but uh, definitely never really knew what in the world I was doing. So um, I appreciate him sharing that. I learned a lot about rabbits and poultry specifically. So. So like I say, do not hesitate to email me if you do have questions. Yeah. And I'll send your, I will also post um, Phil's email address in that link as well. So got questions feel free to drop them in the chat box otherwise thank you best of luck and if you need anything feel free to contact us